This is a special tribute to the late Dr. Yasu Persaud. We sadly announced the passing of Dr. Yasu Persaud. He was born on October 18, 1928, and departed this world on January 17, 2022. The late Dr. Yasu Persaud was a man of courage, achievement, philanthropy, and humility, an admired son of Guyana. Yesu Prasad transformed the landscape of Guyana in economics, politics, and culture in truly historic ways which are imprinted on the history of Guyana. His entrepreneurship and achievements are exemplary. His generosity of heart and support of the needy are unmatched. His commitment, dedication, and outstanding service in the preservation and promotion of Indian history and culture will always be remembered a consummate, energetic visionary. A great son of Guyana is gone. He was a man of peace, yet one with strong conviction of respect for culture and discipline. He will be fondly remembered by all those who knew him. May his soul rest in peace. On this program this evening, which is pre-recorded, you will see a 45-minute film featuring the life of Mr. Yasu Prasad, former chairman of Demerara Distillers Limited. The film was made by the University of Warwick, which um, endowed him with a doctorate, honorary doctorate, and the, I have the pleasure of the key people in the production of the film, Dr. David Abedin, we all know him, one of Guyana's very talented um, writers. He was the executive producer in the program. Mr. Arlen Harris, producer and co-director. And young Dan Harris Voider, co-director, cameraman and editor. So let me just say to those persons who are here, welcome and to say you out there, welcome as well. Guyana. Land of six peoples, forged by Amerindians, African slaves, Portuguese, and Asian indenture. Sugar, rum, and gold. Dr. Passat came from a sugar plantation. He will tell you himself he used to catch rats. That's how he started. Under the colonial period of time, race was used to divide our people. His mother adopted an African boy and he grew up to call this boy Mamu, uh, an Indian name for uncle. He lived in the same home and showed reverence and respect for someone of African descent. Yesu Prasad is an icon. He is the quintessential businessman. Yesu was able to sail the sugar industry into safe waters. I think that his name would be indelibly written in the history of this country as a fighter for democracy and human rights. People were afraid to disagree with those who had state power, and Dr. Passard was the one voice who disagreed. He provided that breath of fresh air that allowed Guyanese to think for themselves. He's a just an a hard-working, tireless, honest man who we all admire. Yesu Passard recently celebrated his 90th birthday. His story symbolizes the changes that have taken place in Guyana in the 20th and 21st centuries.
So here we are this morning. The venue could not have been better. As usual, we refer to this as the home of God. And uh, as we assemble here today, we are with you, Dr. Yesuji. You have been an amazing role model, supporter, advisor. You're such a good friend to all, not just to indo Guyanese, you're a friend to all. You've given so much to our community, you love people, and you'd like to see Guyana move forward in peace. And you've always dreamed and spoken about a government of national unity. I know that's your dream. It's my dream too. I love you. People again, I love you. You've given so much. And you've taught me that you receive what you give. Keep giving, my dear friend. I'm certain that you have seen sadness in tough times too, but well known of you, you have been able to find inner strength ever so often, and to be brave, but you should be sad journey with him. My name is Moses Virasami Nagamutu. I am the Prime Minister of the Republic of Guyana. Yesu Prasad's life was one that was rooted in the sugar industry. He, he came from a rural community, Diamond. His experience in the sugar industry was of an exceptional nature, so he understood it. They came as indentured immigrants to Guyana to work on the sugar plantations. The people brought what little they had. A loji is, was built for the slaves, and when the slaves left, it was handed over to the Indian immigrants. So it's nothing glorious. Some places you live, half of the floor was mud, and half was flooring. My father came in 1894, and my mother in 1897. The first thing you see in her and him is his no their oh, noses. Yes, so you have the same nose. Where I lived in was a lot more, I would say, superior. The reason for that, I had a father who worked like a horse. He gets results like a horse. And he ain't taking no second best. You have a garden at the back of the cow pen. You had a little section there you could plant your plants. And many people use that very effectively. I help out by cutting grass for the cows, by feeding the cows, by watering them, cleaning them. They were cutting cane, cutting cane tops to plant in the canes in the sugar cane plantations of British Guyana, owned by expatriates, and they bully these people to, do, to get them to do anything. Shoveling, earth, any type of work that is there to be done, they had to do it. So it was manual work of the highest order. You know, some people have a knack to save, even if it's a penny. And those people in those days, they will starve themselves to save a penny. And that's what led them on to start little businesses that when they finished their indentureships. Uh, Rock, my father, was an outstanding man. He was one among few. There were not many like him. He was as strong as an ox. Where he got the strength from, I don't know. 
what we usually ask him when as little boys, people are complaining, you're not in our heart, no, you do. He said, boys, the strength I've built, I eat, and I eat well. And you must learn that too. Don't starve yourself to save money. And if the British cursed him, he would give them all about their mother. And mother and mother. He suffered enormously as a result. The deputy manager decided to demote him. Send him to work in a cane cutting gang, where in six months he would be finished. But rock was rock. They couldn't break him. Finished his six months, and he was taking up more work. So the overseers and managers start to admire this man. What kind of man this? All his counterparts are falling down on the job, and he's just going along as if nothing has happened. My mom played an important role. She was a field worker too. And she had to get up early in the morning to cook, get the meal ready for breakfast and lunch, pack it in saucepans for them to go to the back down. She was a strong woman, and then finally she decided she was going to go and work on the estate too, to earn her keep. But I think it was too much for her. She died at an early age. She died at 57. What I notice with Yesu is that he probably derived some of his qualities from his parents because they seem to me to have been hardworking and single-minded people who were not just concerned with survival as lots of Indians were. They had a vision of the future and they wanted their children, in particular Yesu, to be somebody who could take his place in society, which eventually is what happened. I'm Amina Gafur, editor of the Arts Journal. I'm also administrator of the Gafur Foundation. Age 13, 14, my father insisted I go to high school, ignoring that the cost that would be attached there too, because their school fees, their books, and their lunch money. My parents bounded their bellies very tight. I spent eight years in high school, and I had to pull out on my own, because my father just could not carry the bill. Well, we explained it to him, and I said, all right, OK, OK. But what are you going to do? I said, I'll find a job. Finding a job was not easy. But the first job I found was born in Georgetown, paying $3 a week to ride seven miles each way, 14 miles a day. And at the end of the week, what you have next to nothing, because you have to eat. You have to spend money on the bicycle, anything goes wrong. So after eight months, I decided, no, I'm not going anymore. I decided on my own. Explained it to my old man. And he said, all right, don't worry. We're going to find something else we do. And on the estate, there was a job going. I was sent to learn rat catching at Lenora, where you set the bait, and the rat come and eat the bait. Anyway, it was a job. I fulfilled that to the satisfaction of the general manager. And then he put me in the spring gang in charge of eight men. Called me again. He said, Isu, come here, boy. You know you've done a good job? I am now going to transfer you to a place where you belong. You're more intelligent than all the boys combined. I said, no, sir. I was transferred to the cane punts. My job was to ensure the cane punts leave empty. They came back full and they arrive on time. The factory cannot wait for wake cane. It's very, very expensive. Soon took on that very, very well. And he says, Isu, what else can I give you, boy? I said, there are many jobs on this estate which I could do. And that was my final upgrade on the sugar estate as 
supervisor, superintendent, the highest you could go. All local people, they can't go higher than that. Go higher than that, no. You are going to be transgressing on the preserve of the expatriates. <clears throat> and in those days, they only used to employ Scottish or English expatriate overseers. So I decided, while they, you know, I'm thinking, I'm married, I have a wife, I have expenses. I've heard people going to England and they're doing well. Why shouldn't I try? If I want to go to England, do we have enough money? She said, I have some money, save up, but you waste some, you know. He said, look, if you go, uh, I'll be able to get the passage for you. We travel by boat. She said, we got money for that. I booked the passage. We arrive at uh, Victoria. I've never seen such a big station in my life. 18 platforms. All the West Indians are stupefied. Oh, and this is in England. This is when we went to England. We arrive at this house. My oh, gosh. It's the worst thing I've seen. He's putting us to us in a bedroom. This case we move. So I ask, how can you do this, man? You're just one of us, but you come from a different part of the world. He said, look, I have to do this. I, I can't pay my ways. I got to pay everybody. So I said, thank you very much, sir. He said, you're going away? I said, yes. Living in England for a person in the 50s w was not easy. I myself went up there early 60s. That was the time when England had no central heating. By the time you run up and slot your sixpence and you run the mark, the water is cold. <laughs> and we found a place right in Earl's Court, but in the attic. I had to walk up those six stairs. They're all five and six stories building. Heinz 57 varieties. That was a challenging job. Night to work too. But I got a premium of one and a half times, which was good enough for me, because it means I could save. And then you get a meal at 10 o'clock, a subsidized meal, anything you want, what they have. And then I was called in one day by personnel. You, the young man, wants to go in days. I said, yes, thank you. So you're going in days as from next week. And why do you want to go in days? I said, sir, my entire aim and objective was to come to Britain to study. And when I get time, I usually attend three or four polytechnics between the hours. He said, you're doing all of that? I said, yes, sir. And what you'll do when you go in days? I said, I'd only study at night. I know all about some varieties. And even so, I was transferred to the soup department where I learned about making soup too. So in that period, everyone had thought that England held the answer. He went and, of course, he studied uh, accountancy, and he elevated himself in the world of accountants. Yes, when I started uh, working at a accounting firm, I was reckoned to be above par, and that most of the large audits I took part in. I was in that privileged position when this offer from Guyana came for a post in Georgetown, Guyana, the post of inspector of taxes. It must not have been easy for him to have a wife and three children and yet study and come back. My boss told me when I told him I was leaving and sent in my resignation. He said, young man, you're going to a country where they're tearing people to pieces. Races against races. That's where you want to go? I say to you, your job is here. Your place of living is here. I've been to your house. I see your house. You have a lovely house in a good area. What else do you want? I've already told you that I'm buying another partnership. And I intend to give that partnership to you to run. Because I don't find anyone good enough to manage that. If you go and come back, I'll give you the partnership. So, 
what do you say to a man like this? I went home, discussed it with my wife, and she turned on me. She said, why did you come for England, to England? For what? Are you reneging now? So <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. In the years before Guyanese independence from Britain in 1966, there was widespread violence as politicians of different races jockeyed for power. At that time, there was so much conflict that I remember now that um, February the 16th was Black Friday in this country. And when um, protesters were burning down Georgetown, my mother and my grandmother, and so they said to us, um, y'all are young people, go. England didn't um, ask for a visa in those days, so we went. I came home, back to my country, because of the promise I had made to my wife, my family, and all my relatives. And here I am to do what I have to do. And this is when we came back. We were living in Prashad Nagar. These are 1967. We we're back in Guyana. When he came back, he was also recognized as someone who was ably qualified to, for leadership role in the sugar industry. He used to work on the uh, Sambaj Parker, the original expatriate owners of the sugar industry. He worked on the Jessels, which had controlled the sugar industry. And he worked in managerial position. Well, when I returned, my father felt out of this world. In fact, he would take me places and invite me to meet the manager. And I was seen as <laughs> the manager. But the manager knew how, didn't know how to act. So that gave him a lot of satisfaction. Very few Guyanese at that time of Indian descent or of, of color were elevated. When Oliver Jessel took over, the Marara Company, Savage Parker, and all the other companies. He was appointing a new group finance director. Oliver Jessel had a statement issued for the press. Guyana has some of the brightest people in this world. We had the experience of a young officer here who having spent just a few years with us. As from today, He'll be taking over the role that formerly was occupied by an expatriate senior officer. He's been, he will be Sabach Parker, Demerara Company, Jessel's the lot, Group Finance Director. Everything to do with finance, he'll be responsible for. So you see how we treat our people? Unlike the others, he was throwing a, a ball at Booker's. That day when it was announced, I felt that I had conquered Mount Everest. My father took me to meet one of the big ones. I went to the house of Mr. Alf Balfour, who was the general manager of the estate. And to my utter surprise, the door, front door was open and not the back. Locals had to go to the back door. And I was told by one of his underlings, please use the front door. And this big one, having heard what I had accomplished, we went up straight upstairs. And Mr. Balfour, that was the name man, hugged me. He said, he said, boy, you've done well, you've done well. You make all of us look small. Yesu knew that the only way you can rise above the class stratification or ethnic stratification is by excellence. And that's what he did. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our guest of honor, Dr. Yusuf Zohar. The master architect who has designed this organization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Prasad, for your great contribution. And happy, happy 90th birthday. <laughs>
I'm Kumal Samaru, Executive Chairman of Demerara Distillers Limited. I first met Dr. Passad when the company that I worked with, the Booker's Group of Company, was acquired by the government. He became the Executive Chairman. Yesu Passad went on to run most sugar corporations in Guyana. Sandback Parker, one of Guyana's biggest, was taken over by Jessels and nationalized along with Booker's in the mid-70s by the government of Forbes Burnham. Booker is known worldwide for the Booker Prize for Literature. I am Carl Greenidge, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Yes, Upasad was um, one of the managers of um, the Booker's Jessers Group of companies in Guyana when the government moved to nationalize those companies. He became an advisor to the government negotiating team and help to shape the nature of the agreement that the government struck with, with the Booker's group of company in 1976. When I first met Yesu, he would have been very close to Forbes Burnham. Burnham was good in many other ways, um, like grow local food and buy local and consume what you grow. And so he had good ideas, but there was this other side that people didn't um, like. These were a series of nationalizations that involved some degree of compensation, but it was, it, it was not confiscation. Businessmen, it didn't um, mesh too good with them. The nationalization of all private business. So there were long negotiations, tough negotiations, including those in which he was involved, and he I think assisted greatly. Dr. Bassad was able to, to create a business that operated within the public sector, but with business objectives and a focus on profit goals. So he played a very decisive role in carving out the rum industry to be very focused on markets and competitiveness. Yesu had started off as an ordinary worker in the sugar industry. In the kitchen at one time of the uh, American uh, soldiers who were here during the war. Having been born on a sugar estate and experienced life on a sugar estate, he saw these businesses as the opportunity to transform the lives of people. So he set about giving opportunities to young men and women to advance their lives within the company, to advance their training, to have reasonable uh, conditions of employment. He's championed those causes to create a modern working environment, even within a state sector. And he moved himself up and had become this uh, tremendous entrepreneur, producing the best liquor in the world. Historically, we were bulk rum suppliers, but Mr. Bassard followed world development, and he knew the time will come when that commodity business, unless you're a huge producer with phenomenal advantages, you're not going to have a place in the world. Yesu's contribution was not only to manage his business efficiently so that it maintained its profile, he then devoted resources, not so much to trying to decimate his, his opponents domestically, but to go on the international and regional market to create a brand that was recognizable as Guyana. So this is Seagram's. Seagram, yeah. The, the head of Seagram. There's you. That's me. This is the guy that worked for us. And the way we did it was as a group, we decided to challenge our employees, our chemists, our blenders, to take the rums that we have in the warehouse and create the best rum that they possibly can. We had an internal competition, right? And so when they've done it, we went through and did the sampling. And one particular blend stood out, wowed everybody. And it was the Eldorado 15-year-old. And that became the first product that we produced for the international market. Yesu managed to establish his rums, starting with 15-year-old. I don't know why he started there, but he did establishing or trying to establish it as the best rum in the world. A few years after we introduced it in the market, 
we entered it into the International Wine and Spirit Competition in London. And it was the one product that was voted best rum in the world. By getting into the branded business, we earned greater profits. We had greater market security once we win consumers over to the brand. And the entire business became much more profitable. What was BWIA was one such place where the airline never left space for non Trinidad products. Somehow, Yesu had cut a deal with Trinidad. They were acknowledging his rums as being the best in the world. Now, that is a feat. I want to tell you that. There are countries which have gone to war over guinea pig, guinea fowls, and stuff like that. In this region, I am sure that in different circumstances, we would have come to war over rum. So, we employ now many more young university graduates providing opportunities for good, high-paying jobs for hundreds of Guyanese. Yes, Supersad has made a tremendous contribution to the industry, but more importantly, he has been able to transform the industry from cane sugar industry into an industry that will have byproducts. And that's, that's how we had the flourishing of DDL. He bought the molasses from the industry and he converted it into rum. And he has now gotten a world brand, in fact for me, uh, the best rum in the world. Ogle Airport. Yesu flies in after opening a branch of the Demerara Bank, which he founded. The first bank in Guyana completely run and owned by local people. It's an old cliche, and it says a man is not old because his hair turns grey. Neither is he old if his teeth starts to decay. He's not old either if he sometimes wobbles at the feet. But there's cause for concern when his mind makes appointments that his body cannot keep. <laughs> <laughs> what you have done with a 15-year-old rock, put in Guyana on top of the world. The branding, and of course, I couldn't say if it still remains as the best rum in the world, but I said it has always been that way. So I think we've run out of space and time now where we could post. It is still the best. It is still the best. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we have Mr. Tiwari, his family, and all of us at the BK Group of Companies. Enjoy your birthday. You don't have to pay for the flight. Today, the flight is for the United no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I met Dr. Yes, super sad. Uh, he invited me for lunch one day, himself, himself and Kamal, when they just formed the Demara Bank. I own the largest quarry within the Caribbean. When I bought this quarry, I was through the advice of Dr. Yes, super sad. One day, a partner came to me and said, listen, I want to buy your share out of the quarry. And he says to me, no, you're not selling any shares. I, I will help you. You're going to manage this quarry and you're going to turn it around. I bought the quarry then for 7.5 million United States dollars. We are paying half for that completely. Yes, yeah, Supersad had set up the Amara Bank. He courted me from the beginning to move my business to him, but I told him I don't want to jump ship. I am Stanley Ming. We are the premises of Ming's Products and Services Limited, who are the agents for Yamaha and Mitsubishi in Guyana. Stanley raced motorbikes, and his son Calvin is an F4 racing champion. He showed us his son's racing car. Back in the early 90s, I needed to establish a letter of credit, I think for about a quarter million US dollars for uh, Yamaha Motor Company. And I was having difficulty with the bank I was dealing with. And I was in a hotel in China, it was like one o'clock in the morning, and my financial uh, uh, director called me and said, look, we have this problem. I said, give me a moment. I said, yes, so here's the opportunity now to move my account to the Amara Bank. I'm having an issue with them, but I'm all the way in China, and I couldn't be there to sign up all the necessary paperwork. He said, Stanley, I don't need paperwork from you. Tell Audrey to call me. Tell her to see what is the amount that you need to have to pay off the other bank, and tell her to write the check. Whenever you get back to Ghana, we'll sort it out. I came back to Ghana, and we, we talked about it, and he kept no urgency. And it took about a year before I got him to get all the paperwork done. But that's the sort of guy he was. When Dr. Prasad took the decision that he will join the call for free and fair elections and committed himself to go on the guard platform, my colleagues from the office called to say that this thing has become national news. Just prior to the 1992 elections, there was a movement by the civil society 
to try to change the political status quo that existed at the time. And uh, up until then, there were question marks about whether Ghana ever had free and fair elections. And they were all very nervous of the repercussions. So I called Dr. Passad and I said, sir, are you sure you're doing the right thing? It's not too risky for our business, for our company. Is the timing right? And he said to me, nope, I've thought about it. It has to be now, and I'm going to do it. I'm Dr. Frank Anthony. I'm a member of parliament. I've been in parliament for the last 12 years. I've been a minister of government for about nine. One of the things that Guyana became known for was rigged elections. On the day of the elections, they got a lot of their supporters to come to the polling station and vote multiple times. The army would come in, they would take the ballot boxes, they'll put them on this army truck, take them away, they'll open the ballot boxes, take out how people actually voted, substitute that with ballots that they wanted, they'll seal them up, and then continue along to the actual place where uh, the counting was to occur. But by then, it was already fiddled. What, what I'm describing is the destruction of votes. People came to the polls uh, wanting to practice their right to vote. But although they were voting, their vote did not count. Walter Rodney, who was fighting for justice and democracy, he was killed. That was the hardening of the dictatorship in the years 1978, 1979, 1980. I, I use those words very cautiously. Forbes Burnham ruled Guyana in an increasingly autocratic style from 1964 to his death in 1985. I'm Sheila George. I'm in this beautiful cathedral where my husband used to be the bishop for over 33 years. People would, uh, would, would tell him, well, you must be careful. There are people watching your house. Some of the people in, uh, in the army were supposed to stand outside your gate to see who was coming to talk with you, what sort of conversations you were carrying on. The Roman Catholic bishop, the Anglican bishop, and the other clergy of the Council of Churches had their home searched except they didn't get into our house because I was over a window and I said, well, the bishop is out. So they just remained in the yard. And what are they searching for? Arms and ammunition. So it was a scary time. <laughs> Mr. Passard then uh, headed a, a movement that focused on civil society and their demands for free and fair elections. I felt very, very belittled. The right that the people had was taken away from them. Imagine you got to change the constitution of a country to go and destroy it. He had a dream of building a local company about which all Guyanese will be proud. He was a fighter for what he believed in. Nothing and nobody could stand in his way. Not even a minister of government who tried to use cab labor to replace striking employees at one time. We had started a new business that was, the shares were held by the government. The government took away that company. Okay. They tried, they threatened uh, to stop our expansion, uh, but Dr. Passard was a fighter and we fought and eventually got our way. I went to Washington along with Bishop Randall George and we went to the highest level. He has been very instrumental in bringing together religious groups, the Catholic Church, the human rights organizations, the University of Guyana, and of course, the business community. They got the Carter Center involved and they got the international community to pay more attention. There was somebody from America's Watch and he was really singing the praises of the government. And Dr. Pessoa, he said, the reports you receive in Washington are not the reality 
of what is happening in Guyana. And he was very surprised. But the main thing they have not tackled, and this is electoral reform. And he said, well, will you be willing to come to the states and talk to representatives and see if you can persuade them? So he went on the job immediately. And together, without anybody knowing, they went off. When the bishop and Dr. Yesu left the country, the government newspaper said that the two people had gone to the States to overthrow the government. They couldn't believe this could really happen. And there they presented a case for help, financial help in particular, and support for the elections that are coming up. In the following year, Jimmy Carter came, came to Guyana, and set up the Carter Center. I met President Carter. He heard I had a big room in my fourth floor. He could use as a, a, a guest for all my private sector people. He wanted to invite them the following morning. So I told him, go ahead, which he did. I just addressed the crowd, look, President Carter wants to come and talk to you. I would suggest you listen and ask questions. Carter was a positive man. He's not a negative guy. Whatever Carter did, Carter had investigated before. The, the main thing was counting the votes at the polling stations rather than having the boxes taken away um, to places unknown. He insisted that the count must be at the place of poll, nothing more, nothing less. No count should be done separately. And it should be done in the presence of the counters. That's one of the critical things that was done. Two, no politicians should be and the stamping grounds of the um, elections. They were able to go through the, the voters' list to free it from any sort of padding and that sort of thing. They were able to control the people who manned the polling station. He stood his ground. So we're talking about 28 years from 1964 to 1992. Lots of people, not only business people, but also professionals from the private businesses and government offices, and lots of people went away. There was a lot of fear within the society, which also led to a lot of division. There was a lot of repression. For example, if I belonged to a political party and you belong to the government party, I couldn't be talking to anybody who is not of your party. The government really tried to pigeonhole people into parties so that they can be attacked on that ground. There was a total blanket on truth, and that was very scary. So we left just with the clothes we were wearing. I boarded the plane and everything with my uh, star and the three children. And they took us off the plane. They said I was hiding jewelry and so on. They searched and they found nothing. That convinced us that let's just leave Guyana for a while. We never wanted to go away. We wanted to stay here and build up, you know? If he did not fight at that time, DDL would not have been what it is. Perhaps DDL might not have even existed. He didn't want a position in government. He just wanted to, to ensure that they were free and fair elections and that democracy would be the order of the day. They believe, yes, Sue, that you're investing in integrity. You're investing in incorruptibility. You want honest, trusted leadership for Guyana. That was Yesu's facade image that spoke to the electorate. And I believe that he has played a very principal role in bringing about electoral changes in Guyana. In fact, a change in, in government. I feel in the date that something has been won. Very elated, happy, and the people have won too. Jimmy Carter himself came out and said that he was very happy that this was one of the best held elections that he had been able to supervise. And everything went really smoothly on the day. Desmond Hoyt, Burnham's successor as president and as leader of the PNC, lost the 1992 general election. And 28 years of PNC rule came to an end. Well, the plight in the country is the plight of all of us. If you ignore the plight of the country, you're ignoring yourself.
And this is what I was concerned about. The development bank that you set up, that provided a lot of jobs. I seem to remember the last time I got a figure from him, it was a few thousand jobs were provided from the financial uh, equity that he provided through IPED, Institute of Private Enterprise Development. I wanted to see people fully employed. There were so many poor people, and you could only raise their income by giving them something to do and help them. I set up IPED without asking for a penny from anyone. I went and found the cash because I had friends in the US, Canada, the Caribbean, and a few even in Guyana. We've, we've helped poor people in every area. Not so poor, some poor, some piss poor. They've all done well, not exceedingly well, but well. Some have done better than most, so much so that they've used the funds to migrate to overseas. <laughs> you have a company that is testimony to the work that he's done and the effectiveness of that work. He hasn't shown a scintilla of arrogance as a businessman, as wealthy and prosperous and successful as he has been and continues to be. Throughout his entire career, he's been a very people-centric, people-focused uh, leader. And I think that's one of his greatest qualities. Even though he himself had not gone on the elections platform, so he has power, this small, humble man. If he was, you know, either the Prime Minister or the President of Ghana, I think it would have been a very different country. We can change um, the conditions of our people if we can all work together for the better of Guyana. Promote what we naturally think about, which is loving each other, whether you're black, green, yellow, or pink, and work for the common good. Stop supporting politicians who try to divide us on racial lines. If we can only do that, again in 10 years, I can tell you, I might not be here, but will be a glorious place to be in.